everyone, and welcome back to an all-new episode of The Financial Confessions. It's me, your girl, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet, and person who loves to talk about money. And today, we are here with a guest to dive deep on a subject that has been widely requested by you guys at home, both for the fashion slash aesthetic angle, but also from a more social justice angle and looking at the prism through which we all approach money based on the person that we are and the body that we're in. I also recently interviewed YouTuber Mina Lei, who talks a lot about things like fashion, culture, beauty, etc. But often when we talk about these things, especially as they pertain to consumerism and our finances and the markets in which we're all operating, we often get requests to dive into these more specifically from a plus size angle. Because when it comes to all of these consumer choices, as well as the way that we're treated in our bodies everywhere from a clothing store to a doctor's office, being in a larger body means something totally different. So while these conversations are complimentary, I think they're both very much worth having, especially as they pertain to the more generalized fat phobia and way that that manifests financially and otherwise. My guest today is actually someone who has collaborated with TFD before in various ways. He is someone who speaks really thoughtfully on these issues and is for the first time ever a debut author. He has a new book that just arrived today in the mail. It's actually coming out August 16th. It's called The Power of Plus. And it's all about these topics and it touches on everything from the finance of it all to the fashion of it all. I'm very, very excited today to be speaking with writer, editor, and friend of TFD, John Luca Russo. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. And before we get started, I want to thank Avast for supporting today's episode of The Financial Confessions. Avast's new all-in-one solution, Avast One, helps you take control of your safety and privacy online. And I also want to thank ShipStation for supporting this episode of The Financial Confessions. If you're a small business owner and want to save time and money when shipping your products, try ShipStation. With ShipStation, your small business can now access the same rates usually reserved for Fortune 500 companies without the contracts or commitments. Use my offer code TFC to get a 60-day free trial. Make ship happen. So for those who may not be familiar with your work, can you talk a little bit about the beat that you kind of cover specifically? Absolutely. So I've worked in journalism for the past five or six years. And I have specifically written about body diversity and how that intersects with the different facets of life from fashion to culture to health, et cetera. And so I've really kind of been able to dig into what it's like to live in a larger body in our society today and the many challenges that comes with it. So that's kind of been my beat over the past few years um, in really digging into that community aspect there. Do you feel like it's fair to say that there is a tax placed on people for being in a larger body? Absolutely. I think it all goes down to the fact that this world is not created for or accommodating of people who live in larger bodies, despite the fact that we have statistics that show that the average American woman, and same for men as well, are plus size. And so it really goes down to the fact that things like fashion and healthcare and even the workplace are not accommodating and welcoming of diverse body types. And that's manifested in many ways. But I think it's something that really hasn't been worked on or or we haven't seen much progress on yet simply because people don't view it as a kind of discrimination or an important thing but the statistics show that a majority of people are plus size so it is a more prevalent issue Um, but plus size people are taxed on many different ways literal tax um, known as kind of the fat tax which is a a higher price that's attributed to clothing um, for having more fabric being needed um, and then other ways as well so i think it's definitely a really prevalent issue that we're seeing but i don't know if everyone is as aware of it or as open to discussing it How do you think that it's possible that we are in a society where, as you say, the majority of people, adults in the society are falling into a category which is oppressed and ostracized and um, sort of uh, regarded as being an aberration when statistically they're the norm? I think a lot of it goes back to the fact that we don't see those bodies reflected. Um, And not just in fashion, right? So in fashion, we know that for so long, we haven't seen any diverse body types reflected. But this also goes into all the other facets of life, too. If you look at Hollywood, top CEOs, tech, all of the people we're seeing kind of broadcasted out there in headlines and imagery, what we're taking in 
is this very thin image because thin people in a lot of ways are granted those privileges to make their way to that spot. And so that's the representation we're seeing. We're not seeing the people in the middle of the country, people who live outside the coastal cities who are plus size, who make up that majority statistic there. We're seeing the rare exceptions. And then society is kind of painting this view that that's how everyone is when really that's not the truth. That's just kind of the select few or the 30 some percent that do live in thinner bodies, but they take up the majority of the representation that we see. You know, I think a lot of people would identify the past several years as being a kind of body positive era um, where I think these kind of maxims and framings were really gaining a lot of popularity. And, um, you know, I think we're being jumped on by, you know, corporations and marketers and, um, it, it definitely became, I think, a huge dialogue and discourse. But, you know, from, from where I sit, you know, who, as a youngish adult woman who's marketed to aggressively as we all are, I don't feel anecdotally that a lot of the bodies that I've seen really change. And that's also from, you know, even a, an ageism sort of perspective or a racial perspective. Like, I do feel like when I think about um, you know, what is presented to me as aspirational, despite the body positive noise, um, it still feels pretty homogenous and pretty centered on thinness. Um, what do you think ha have been sort of the progresses of body positivity and where do you think it's sort of coming up short? It's a hard question because body positivity at its core had really great intentions, like you said. And if you go back years ago and even before body positivity was a thing and you just kind of had the fat liberation movement and other advocates as well, there's these really great intentions and really great people fighting. I think what's happened in the past few years is we've seen this commercialization of body positivity happen, like you, like you spoke of, and we're seeing kind of brands capitalize on this topic of self-love and how they can kind of market it. And in that, they have kind of pushed body positivity away from its core, which is about really centering plus size voices and the representation and accessibility of them. And they've made it something that's more of just kind of a welcoming of all, feel good about yourself message, which while important is not what body positivity was set out to do. And so in that, it's really kind of been watered down to where it doesn't mean as much. So it's hard because the conversation is more prevalent now, right? Like people talk about body positivity now because they know the term. They know people like Ashley Graham who are blazing trails in their own ways. They are more familiar with it, but they're not familiar with the version that's going to push us to the next level of representation. They're familiar with this very watered down and comfortable version that is inclusive of all, but this movement necessarily didn't start to be inclusive of all. It was specifically focused on larger bodies. So I think as it's been watered down, we're seeing less and less impact. There's of course a lot of progress that's been made there. So people like Ashley Graham, Paloma Alcester, Precious Lee, these top models who are now blazing trails at Fashion Week, we're seeing more bodies like them. We're seeing at least the conversation take more form. I mean, even Vogue, for instance, put Paloma and Precious and Yumi Nu and all these models on their covers. The conversations are happening more but the level of the conversations is not really in line with where body positivity started. And I think because of that, we're not seeing as much progress as you think we would be seeing now, you know, 10 plus years into body positivity, 30 plus years into fat liberation. We're not seeing the progress that we would have hoped for because it has kind of been co-opted and commercialized in these ways. Yeah. And also a lot of the models that you mentioned, they are, larger than standard size models, but a lot of them fall into a very, very specific body type that is still, you know, slim waisted, you know, full chested, full hipped, and is, you know, sort of like a very conventional hourglass figure, which at least, you know, uh, I think from a, a, a normal quote unquote average woman's perspective is like in its own way is still quite <laughs> unachievable <laughs> for most of us. Absolutely. And I think this is something that has frustrated a lot of plus size people because it's what they've coined the acceptable plus size body. And while it is far different than the bodies we saw in the Devil Wears Prada, it is not really reflective of what the average plus size woman is. And so what designers will do, they will take these size 12, 14 girls and make them their muses and they will only represent them. And while there's nothing wrong with these women, and I'm in fact a fan of all those women I listed, 
they're not the only body type. I think that's the hard thing in the commercialization of body positivity is that it's centered individual body types when it should center the spectrum of them, which goes far beyond a 24 into a 26, 28, 30 plus. Um, and so that's the real problem here is that even in this body positive movement, we're centering these very rare glamazons that yes, while they might be a size 12, 14, 16, far different than the Devil Wears Prada and the imagery we've seen before. They're not reflective of the average plus size woman, which is a 16, 18, and they're definitely not reflective of the spectrum of sizes above them. And so I think until we reflect that spectrum, we're not gonna see this change that we need because the only voices that are being reflected are the voices that are now normalized, which is a size 12, 14, 16, which of course is bigger than a 0 to 4, but it's not necessarily much different um, as it was a few years ago. So, you know, in your book, uh, you, you're specifically focusing on um, this sort of the, the world of plus size, if we can call it, through the prism of fashion or in the fashion industry. So from a layperson's perspective, if most of the country uh, falls into the category of plus size, then one would think it would be very lucrative for businesses to um, cater to that market, even perhaps more so than they cater to what I guess we can call straight sizes um, because that represents a larger market, you know, because that probably represents more opportunity for new consumers, et cetera. Um, but we do see with a lot of brands, um, especially certain types of brands, many designer brands, um, brands that project a certain image, like we see kind of almost a, a complete avoidance of um, branching into larger sizes or, or, or making their clothes in different cuts. And it's hard to understand what the financial rationale kind of is for that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the finances of why companies are making the decision to exclude such a potentially lucrative market? On paper, you would think that they would want to dive in. They would want to dive into this market that's been estimated to be worth more than $24 billion. But in reality, there's a lot that goes into it that from the outside looking in, you wouldn't expect. So of course, there's this whole topic of stigma. A lot of designers don't want to do plus because simply they don't want plus size bodies to represent their clothes. We know that that is nothing new. The challenges from the financial perspective though, come from the fact that diving into plus is a huge investment. For starters, designers in fashion schools are not taught to design for plus sizes. It's not something that is in their curriculum even today. There are some schools today that will incorporate electives that you can design for plus if you want, but there is no plus size curriculum in these top design institutions. So the designers of today, especially who went to school 10, 15, 20 years ago, don't know how to design for plus. So there's already has to be an investment made in figuring that out. That's done through fit modeling, which is where designers will bring in models of a size 12, 14, 16, 18. They'll fit their garments on them. They'll figure out how do I design for this? How do I accommodate for this? How do I design for curves? And that is really expensive. Of all the designers I talk to, that's the biggest investment they make is in fit models. But that's the only way they can learn about how to design for these body types. Because if they simply grade up, which is about adding two inches per size, it's not gonna accommodate for the different ways that weight is held on different body types. So these fit models are crucial, but that is a huge investment there to constantly be bringing in these models of different sizes to try your clothes on them, to make adjustments, alterations. That's a huge thing up in and of itself. The other aspect of this is the marketing. And this is why a lot of designers stray away, away from doing plus size because reaching this community is more difficult than you would think. You'd think, you know, 68% of American women it should be easy, we'll just put ads out like normal. But this is a customer that's been underserved and ignored for so long. She's not looking in the same places. She's hesitant. She needs to be talked to in a different way. And a majority of designers have never had plus size people around them. So they just don't know how to do that. The same with their marketing firms. They've never marketed to plus before. And marketing to plus is very different than marketing to straight sizes. And so making that investment there means making a community aspect. And so it's hiring plus size consultants. It's talking to the community directly, incorporating their voices. So on all these different levels, there's money that they have to put into it. It is a huge investment. And then there's, of course, it goes down to everything to stocking plus sizes in store, right? For so long, they've only stocked an X, X, uh, extra small to an extra large. How are they going to now double that offering in store? Where's the size? How are they going to ship those out? What about all these different factors? So from start to end, there's a lot of money 
that has to be put in. There's a lot of potential to make that money back. And I think that's what we're seeing designers are finding when they do it right. But the potential for failure is also so large that it scares a lot of people away. And they think, well, we're already doing so well as a business. Does it really matter that much? Yes, there's potential that we could be even bigger, but there's also potential that it could fail and flop so bad. So is it really worth it? I think that's what designers are thinking of a lot. And it's challenging because while this is a huge market, there's a huge potential for failure. And a lot of people simply just don't even know how to take the first step into figuring out whether it's the right move for their business. Why are plus size clothes on average more expensive? From a designer and brand perspective, it's because it takes more money to make them simply because of kind of the the fabric, the fit modeling, all of those aspects, they'll kind of charge more for that. I think that's why we have seen the fat tax come out as it's been called, um, in which designers will charge more for plus sizes. Now there is less of that happening. We're seeing more kind of price equality across the board because designers know how othering that is to charge more for plus, but it's still prevalent. And from the business perspective, it's because it costs more to do plus from everything from design to marketing, the whole investment there is more. So their initial reaction is to charge more, but that really has a bad impact on the customer. You know, an area that I feel, an industry that I feel has become very honestly weird in this era of sort of nominal body positivity, but still largely very sort of crushing uh, normative beauty standards that haven't really changed all that much. Um, And in some cases, I mean, you look at top models who are um, pretty visibly underweight and that's still, I think, very normalized, if not, you know, uh, considered aspirational. Um, Something that I think has become very strange is diet culture um, because the diet industry and the weight loss industry are both still hugely lucrative and um, dominant. And um, the, 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 the outcome is generally the same, right? Like you're still seeing an emphasis being placed on weight loss, but I think it's now become sort of superficially less acceptable to um, speak strictly in terms of weight loss. You'll speak in terms of you know, health and psychology and habit forming and, you know, all of this stuff. But at the end of the day, a lot of it still boils down to calorie tracking with an explicit goal of weight loss. And, you know, again, as a woman in my demographic bracket, I'm marketed a lot of those things. Um, And it's very interesting how we've sort of changed the ways in which we can talk about them um, and yet not really seen a ton of changes in the sort of ideological underpinning of the industry, which is now post pandemic more, more lucrative than it's ever been. Um, can you talk about the state of the diet and weight loss industry right now? I think at the end of the day, a diet is a diet, right? You can't escape it from what it is. But with that commercialization of body positivity, the diet industry has tried to welcome in this message of self-love where it doesn't fit, which is why we see it happen so much that people will say, oh, this isn't a diet, it's a lifestyle change, when really at its core, what is it? It's a diet to lose weight. And I think the more that we pretend that it's not, the more frustration is going to be caused. But the diet industry really wants to capitalize on self-love because they know how much it can make them. It is a lucrative industry for a reason. They know that by saying, oh, this is just about doing what's best for you. If they change the narrative to be something that is more welcoming, more exciting, more appealing, they're going to bring back all these people who have strayed away from it because the diets they grew up with never worked. So now they're going to try something new because it's not a diet. It's a lifestyle change. It's something different. It's about self-love. So they'll give that a try. It's something new. The diet industry is just trying to stay alive and it will probably always stay alive. People will always want to lose weight because it is easier to live in this society if you are of a smaller size. 
Um, and the diet industry knows that they'll do anything to market to this community to make them shrink down, to make them smaller because they're feeding off these insecurities under this new umbrella of false self-love when really we, or I hope we can see through it that it's really not real and it's not going to make a change. I mean, we have the statistics that over 90% of diets fail. That's not changing just because you slap on a sticker of self-love. That will always stay the same. And there's a reason they fail, but that reason they want to avoid what they'd rather focus on is trying to use your insecurities against you under this new smoke screen to try and ultimately get you to spend your money and continue to fail so that you continue to feed into it. Why do they fail on average diets? Um, it's There's a kind of a handful of reasons. I think a lot of diets last for about two years. I think it's at the two year mark that you see most of them fail. And most of it is about sustainability, right? So when you're on a diet, it's usually very restrictive. It's something that, you know, a lot of times is not healthy uh, and you're following a very strict structure. Over time, as life gets in, as you kind of adjust to a non-strict life, uh, you kind of go back to old habits and your body goes back to it's natural process, it's natural metabolism that's not being changed because of a very low calorie regimen, a very high exercise regimen. It's going back to its normal state of being, which for a lot of people is bigger. And I think we have so many statistics now that show genetics play a huge role here. Some people are bigger, they, that is their natural state of being, of being in a bigger body. And you can't change that. You might be able to change it for a few months, a few years even, but once you kind of, fall back into your natural state of being, your body is going to reflect that. But when people follow strict regimens for so long, you're gonna see a change of course. If you're only eating 1,000 to 1,500 calories a day, of course you're gonna lose weight for as long as you stick to that. But the second you go back to eating a healthy amount of calories, which is above 1,500, uh, you're gonna see the weight come back on. You mentioned, um, you know, when referring to diet culture that people are always going to want to lose weight in this context because life is a lot harder the bigger you are, kind of period. Um, and it reminds me of, you know, people, you know, we, we're in a time right now where, for example, um, trans people are being very heavily targeted and vilified. And a lot of people, I think, will uh, point to um, statistics showing um, poor mental health, uh, you know, amongst the trans community. Um, you know, high levels of things like depression, self-harm, you know, so on and so forth, um, which to me has always come across as like, well, yeah, I mean, they live in a world where they're constantly punished and ostracized for trying to live a normal life and be themselves. Um, and you sort of kind of get the same sense from uh, living in a larger body of you're living in a world that is constantly feeding you very specific and negative narratives about um, about your natural state and about the way you know you appear and, and so forth. So obviously, you know, it's going to be appealing in that context to want to change. And then, you know, the uh, the success of the diet industry, the prevalence of people wanting to lose weight is then used as evidence. Well, see, this is what is you know, more desirable for people. And it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I'm curious if you can talk about that dynamic and specifically how the uh, the healthcare um, that is received and, and sort of the, the interaction with the medical community by the plus community, um, how that plays into it. Absolutely, it's this whole conversation of cause and effect. And it, like you said, extends far beyond fashion, which is the important thing here. Um, so specifically in the medical industry, plus size people have a very difficult relationship there with doctors and medical professionals because of the years of stigma and abuse that have been prevalent within the medical industry. And so there are studies that have come out about this, but a lot of doctors and plus size patients have terrible relationships and no trust because oftentimes the doctors will resort to offering weight loss as a suggestion for any ailment, for any illness. And that's a real problem because if you go to the doctor about something that has nothing to do with your weight and they tell you the cure is weight loss, you're going to know that they're not really caring here. They're just looking at your body and making a judgment based on that. So there's this really difficult relationship here because of the medical fat phobia that we have seen for so many years fester within the industry. Um, and of course, it goes beyond doctors as well. It goes down to everyone, to therapists and, and everyone who can have a, um, a, an 
impact on someone's mind and the way they view themselves and, and how they're feeling. They're projecting these stigmas continuously based on health. And this topic of health is so dense, right? But we have so many statistics now and studies that show that not only plus size people, but if we're getting to the specifics, you know, plus size black people and plus size black women in particular are heavily discriminated against in the medical industry. And they have been for decades now, for as long as it goes back. Um, and that's because the stigma is leading that, right? Doctors are looking at these bodies and they're judging them based on that. They're not judging them based on tests or, you know, blood levels or all those things. They're just looking at the body. They're looking at what the weight is and they're making an assessment solely based on that and on the BMI, which going back to its origin was never created to be a measure of health. It was created as um, by a mathematician to be a way to find out the average size of a man. It didn't, uh, you know, take into consideration all these different body types that had nothing to do with health, but it's been used as a marker of health now that has been weaponized against people um, to see whether or not your BMI is small enough to be deemed worthy of proper medical care or being worthy of being healthy. Uh, and it's crazy how prevalent that's become over the years, but it's really been used against the plus size community who has been ostracized from the medical industry. And we're seeing this in the ways that they're rejected medical care, how they're not taken seriously, how they're told that they are just fine when really there's a problem that is not being explored and not being investigated. And so when it comes down to it, plus size people today are dealing with real discrimination, real oppression, real stigma that's going ignored because it's being viewed as something that they can change. Doctors are telling them, you don't have to be fat, you could lose weight, when really is that true? Or can you just look into what the problem is? Can you just have this conversation without rushing to that judgment? Most times they cannot, which is why there's such a bad relationship there. When it comes to the, the finances of it specifically, you know, we talked at the very beginning about the quote, fat tax, and I think, you know, a lot of the comments we'll receive when we cover a specific subject, um, whether it is um, fashion, beauty, you mentioned also that statistically, you know, um, executives and people in high positions of power and professional capacities typically err toward a smaller body size. Um, that basically in all of these areas that we touch on and when we touch on the finances of them, we will get comments along the lines of like, but you have to understand this is very different for people in a bigger body. Like we have to shop different places. We have different opportunities. We have to present ourselves differently. Like we can't just do these things or opt out of these purchases the way someone in a smaller body might. So can you talk a bit about the um, the specific costs that, it, that are placed on people in larger bodies um, to overcome those things? Absolutely. I think in my career so far, I have had the, the privilege of viewing this from different aspects. I started my career in theater and then went to entertainment, to fashion, to tech. And so I've seen it kind of take fold in all these different industries. And it's very similar in all of them. Uh, for instance, if someone is going for a job interview, right, and someone wears a size medium, they can go to the mall the night before and find something in their size easily. They have an array of options. They can pick what fits them best, what they want. They can purchase that, whether it's an expensive garment or fast fashion, they can pick that, they're good. When you're looking at someone who wears a 3X, 4X, a majority of those brands that cater to them which is about 20% of the entire fashion industry sells plus sizes, even though there's no specific there into what plus sizes means since that's a spectrum of sizes. Um, that of those 20% of brands, only a handful and a small handful sell plus sizes in store. So these plus size shoppers, if they have a job interview the next day, if they're going to work in tech where you know a lot of times people are wearing suits for these big meetings and all of that, uh, they have to go and order online. Well, they can't do that the night before. And if they do, they're going to have to pay for that expedited shipping. Uh, and so already they have to go online. It's an othering feeling to begin with. It's frustrating to not have that accessibility in store like people who shop straight sizes do. There's a the whole shipping cost then. Some brands who do plus offer free shipping for this reason. Some of them don't. And so you have to pay for shipping. If you need expedited shipping, you're paying for that. Then it could come and not fit. So you're paying for it to go back if they don't have free returns. Then you have to order it again. So all that time, your interview is probably already gone. You already missed out. You probably didn't go. So there's that whole aspect there of little costs that continue to add up. It's things like flying on a plane. If you're going for a job interview from New York to LA and you're plus size, you might pay for another seat 
so that you can actually fit and be comfortable and not be judged and ridiculed by the person next to you. Of all the airlines we have, only I believe Southwest has a customer of size policy that allows you to pay for the seat next to you and then they will refund you for it, which is not accessible to everyone because paying for two seats is not a little price. Um, but if it's possible, it's something you can do, but all the other airlines don't offer that, right? So if you wanna be comfortable, you're upgrading or you're paying for the seat next to you to leave it empty so that you can fly and be comfortable. Uh, things like that, it's everyday little things that add up. These extra prices, these extra costs of being fat continue to add up and to separate plus size people into this category that is difficult to navigate because it makes them think, why should I even try? Why should I go for that promotion? Why should I go for that job in New York City? Why should I even try these things when I know the odds are already against me? Why do you think we see such... Um striking differences in size as we move up the professional ladder? I think it's because the people who get to these higher level positions have always been told it's possible or who are you know, learning that it is possible. But it goes down to the fact that plus size people are not told to aspire to accomplish great things. They're told from specifically the diet industry and also their families and people closest to them to shrink, to cover, to hide. It's a constant message that they're fed that they shouldn't make noise. They shouldn't be loud. They shouldn't try to be like X, Y, and Z. They should just try to stay in their own little lane and try to lose weight and that's it. And so they go on this path of, lose weight or die trying. And they never try to do anything that's far outside of that because they're never represented to show that that's possible. And that was one of the most difficult things for me as well when I joined the fashion industry, seeing that there was no one like me. I remember going to Condé Nast my first day and going through the magazine offices, going to meetings in Allure and Teen Vogue and Glamour and kind of going through and seeing I was the only one there. And this was you know, a few years back before there was more of an inclusivity revolution in fashion but I was the only one who looked like me and I was wearing like old Navy at the time. And I felt so different to be walking around in the office where Anna Wintour is probably a few doors away and knowing that I look the way I am. And while that is supposed to be okay or body positivity tells us that's supposed to be okay, in the moment you feel so different that it's this thing, is it worth trying? Is it worth breaking down that door? For thin people, the size has never been a question. You know, they've always had access to the clothes. They've always kind of been perceived by society as someone who is capable. But when you're plus size, there is this stigma automatically attached to it where people look at you and they think lesser. They do not think you're able to do these things. They think you're a slob and you're lazy and you don't have big dreams. They think you're someone who just wants to eat the day away and that's it. When really we do have dreams, right? Where people just as anyone else, there's no difference other than the weight. And really that shouldn't even be considered a factor here, but it is something that's been used against us. Just this straight stigma that's thrown at us all the time. So I wanna take a quick pause here and once again, thank today's episode sponsor, Avast. As a digital first media company, digital safety is incredibly necessary in all forms and is something that's very important to us here at TFD. Today's sponsor, Avast, has been a global leader in cybersecurity for more than 30 years and is trusted by over 435 million users. Avast empowers you with digital safety and privacy no matter who you are, where you are, how you connect, or your budget. Avast One offers both free and premium options. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. And just a few of the amazing features they have that we here at TFD use all the time are things like their antivirus software, which is award-winning and stops viruses and malware from harming your devices, as well as PC Speedup, which optimizes the background activity of your apps in order to speed up your PC, something that is very important with all of the video calls and meetings you're probably still taking these days. Avast prevents over 1.5 billion attacks every month, and with Avast One, you can confidently take control of your digital presence without worrying about viruses, phishing attacks, ransomware, hacking attempts, and other cyber crimes. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. And to be totally honest, one of the reasons here at TFD we've never ventured into selling tangible products online was because of the logistics involved. It's either too expensive, fulfillment is overwhelming, coordinating with shipping companies felt like a hassle, or it wasn't even something that I felt like I had the energy to think about. But it's 2022, and as much as it's nice to shop in person, we've all defaulted to shopping online over the past couple years, and I know how valuable it is as a business owner. All of this is to say that online shopping isn't slowing down anytime soon. Here at TFD, we were recently introduced to ShipStation, a company that is trusted by over 100,000 e-commerce sellers, 
and learn that they take the headache out of every aspect of selling products online. They keep track of the orders for you, they help you easily find the best shipping carrier with deeply discounted rates, and they automate just about any shipping task with just a few clicks. As a small business owner, outsourcing tasks that relieve you of the mental load involved in any task is incredibly valuable. As you all know here at TFD, we're all about saving money and spending in the smartest way possible. And with ShipStation, your small business can access the same discounted rates usually reserved for Fortune 500 companies without the contracts or the commitments. ShipStation works with every carrier, so you can always find the best fit for you. Ship more in less time with ShipStation. Use my offer code TFC to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no hassle, stress-free shipping. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and type in TFC. ShipStation, make ship happen. And now let's get back to our chat with Gianluca. So one thing that I think is really striking about the like executive and, you know, you speak about working in the tech space um, where I think this is so prevalent, like, because it's an extremely male dominated space and a very specific type of man at that, let's be clear. Um, but there, I think in the way that, you know, women, uh, especially historically in industries like fashion um, and so forth are, you know, there's a huge, huge social premium placed on um, thinness and, you know, having a certain appearance. And it's, it's really, I would say in general, a, a question of aesthetics in, in large part. I mean, there's obviously, there's a lot of, you know, sort of assumptions that go into it about like discipline and control and this, that, and the other. But it is ultimately, I think in a lot of cases, a, an aesthetic question. Whereas when you look at like the male CEO, so like, I feel like every day on Twitter, there's like a tech CEO or a startup guy who like goes viral because he's like doing a challenge for his employees where like, if you get down to a certain BMI or like, you lose a certain amount of weight or like you bike a certain distance, then you'll get like your team gets a bonus or like you'll get a promotion or like whatever they're doing. Um, but it does seem in these spaces in these more male dominated spaces that we're seeing a move towards health. And it's a question of, you know, we're, we're, we're getting healthy as a team that often again, just redounds to weight. And you look at these men, I mean, all of the tech CEOs that I can think of in my mind, like, I mean, some of them are like quite spindly, like Jack Dorsey seems like, is that man okay? Like, um, and in, in many cases, we're talking about men who don't even appear to live super healthy lives in a lot of ways. They talk about the fact that they work a hundred hours a week, which like could not be good for your body. But yet there is this very specific and strange paradigm of health that seems to be also in and, in and of itself about appearance the way it is for women, but yet is sort of under a different um, a different moniker and maybe more socially acceptable um, for sort of the masculine contingent. Um, can you talk about that dynamic specifically and, and how you feel that it's sort of filtering into our professional spaces? Absolutely. Well, I think there's this divide between men and women. There's this huge gender divide on how they view health um, and how this topic is kind of manifested in those circles. I think for men, health often means weight and that's it. And then it, you know, if we're talking about strength, then it means muscles. It's very cut and dry there. And so with all these men in charge of tech and all these other industries, that's kind of the, the message that they're promoting is health means how much you weigh, when really that's not the case. And health is so much more complex and multi-layer than that. But they really simplify it down to just that, because that's what we've been told for so long, right? By the BMI and by all these different doctors and professionals is that what you weigh equals, you know, what your health status or level is. Really, that's not the truth, but that's what they focus on because it's tangible. It's a number that they can look at as people who are number focused and say, all right, as a team, we lost a thousand pounds in the past six months. That's so great. They can celebrate that number there, but did it really have an impact on overall health? How do you measure that? How do you measure health? For men, I think it all goes down to that. It's that cut and dry. It's that if you're fat, you're unhealthy, you're unwanted, you're undesirable. So try to be skinny, try to be, you know, very thin and ripped and as muscular as you can be. Um, it's this really simple, simplified view of health that is really not helpful at all. For women, it's a little different because women kind of understand the complexities of it more uh, because the industries have marketed them that way. Um, and I think women do a better job of just knowing their bodies than men will ever. Uh, and so they kind of know the complexities there. They know that you know, it's about more than health. They know that there's, you know, different aspects that contribute to weight gain or weight loss. 
Um, there's more room for conversation there. But when it comes to men who are in tech and in other industries are the people in charge, they kind of simplify it down to just lose the weight, get to that goal number and your life will be perfect and you'll be able to succeed and be successful and happy and healthy. That's not the case. That will never be the case because everything is so more multi-layered than that. Um, but I think body positivity has not even reached men in a tangible way yet. Um, definitely not a way that we're seeing across industries. I don't know how much longer it will be until that conversation even erupts. I think it'll be a long time from my viewpoint and from where I'm at, um, which is very unfortunate as a man myself. But I think it's the unfortunate truth that men have rejected body positivity in this conversation for as long as possible. And they will continue to do so um, until it's time when it just has to erupt and happen. There are so many like male specific diets that have like propagated over the past couple of years that are so deranged and like what is going on with you guys like the carnivore diet like there's like so many guys on Twitter who just like talk about how they eat only Jordan Peterson being one of them but there's a lot of them and they talk about how they only eat raw meat and it's like cured all of their ailments and I'm like you cannot tell me that this is not the equivalent of like the 60s housewife like just eat you know celery for five days and you'll you know lose all your weight like it is mind-boggling to me that this masculine coded diet culture that is clearly just as deranged and clearly just as focused on really effective ways to manage calories is somehow perceived as more acceptable yeah i mean those men are something else. I do not identify with that group of people and never will. But it's just, it goes, like you said, it goes back to this toxic masculinity there, right? They want to seem strong. They want to seem like cavemen, essentially, and people who can have these very, you know, lean diets and these physiques that are like Greek goddesses, like Hercules come to life. And it's like, okay, but is that real? And also, is it attainable? Because it's not. Like the people you see with those bodies, did so in likely unhealthy ways or had the genetics to be able to reach that easily. And honestly, good for them if you have those genetics. I mean, that's not a choice. That's what you were gifted with. So good for you. Enjoy it. But that's not attainable by all, right? I'm not going to go and eat a raw steak and then suddenly like lose a hundred pounds. That's just not going to happen. So to say otherwise is just a crazy fantasy that they've somehow constructed to try to keep up with this masculine image they want to preserve. Can you talk a little bit, so you mentioned the limitations in choice when it comes to um, shopping for, for example, clothes. Um, and I've also, I've read quite a bit about the, the sort of tax that is placed on larger bodies to present as, um, you know, done up. You know, you're not going to be the way, you know, if a, a very thin person might be able to walk out in, you know, a hoodie and still be perceived as kind of pulled together or, minimalist and chic, um, that is just not an option because if you are over a certain size, that same sort of styling is going to just per be perceived as, you know, not putting in the effort or, or what have you. But we also hear a lot about, you know, when it comes to a lack of options in terms of shopping for food, for example, food deserts, like we often see um, these correlations between, you know, larger people often having um, more limited choices in terms of, you know, where they're buying almost all of their consumer goods. Um, and it's ironic that we talk so much about sort of reframing this through health um, when, you know, the accessibility of huge amounts of the country to even access fresh produce, you know, things that are quote unquote, the most healthy is so limited. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the socioeconomic landscape and the consumer landscape of being plus size? Absolutely. I think this, the statistics show that a lot of people who are plus size come from a lower socioeconomic background. And like you said, that's because of things like food deserts, it's accessibility, availability, what can they get at a low cost point that is going to sustain them. And then if they have family, sustain their children, sustain the people that they're taking care of. There is so many factors there that we kind of often put blame on a person for, right? It's your fault you're this big, you made yourself this way, when we don't take into consideration everything else that's going on around here. And so a lot of people are in what has been coined by the media, the middle of the country. I hate that term because like now I live in the middle of the country, um, but I lived in upstate New York before this where it was like very similar. So I feel like there's middles of the country in every state, but these people who are kind of outside of these areas of availability and accessibility, 
have to do the best with what they're given. And oftentimes that means things like fast food. It means things that are cheap, easy. These are also people who are likely working, you know, two, three jobs. They have to make ends meet. They don't have a lot of money to spend on food, especially if they have young children, if they have families, if they're taking care, taking care of grandparents, all these different aspects here. Uh, money is tight. People do not have X amount of money to just throw around on food. They just need to make ends meet and make enough to sustain the people that they're taking care of, including themselves. And because of that, they go to places like, you know, fast food places and, and places that are not quote unquote healthy, but that are available. That's what they can go to. That's the resources they have. They have to make the most of it. That's the position that they're in. And so what's going to happen is what we see. You know, people are of a larger size. People are unaware of this. They don't have access to these things. It's the whole cause and effect conversation once again. My like absolute all time nemesis in terms of like personal finance memes are like the ones where it'll be um, like a guy will go to the grocery store and get like a bag of dried beans, a bell pepper, an onion, um, like a thing of oil, whatever, and be like, I'm feeding my family of six for 40 cents a day. And I'm like, okay. But like, first of all, <laughs> congratulations that you're eating beans 18 meals in a row. But also like, how long does it take you to prepare that stuff? Like, how long does it take you to portion it out, to freeze it? Like, do you even have the proper storage to keep all that stuff? Like, it is just to me the extent to which people feel um, empowered to shame um, people for opting for convenience when, as you put it, many, we're talking about a country where very few people are even paid a living wage at their primary job to not have to work more than one job if they're raising a family. Like the shaming that happens for just like opting for something that is relatively convenient is just mind boggling to me because those are the same people who would say the most precious thing you have is your time. So something that you mentioned earlier that kind of stuck out with me um, that I think is a really, really fascinating dynamic, specifically as it pertains to weight. Although I'm, we're interviewing soon for TFC, um, Imani Barbarin, who's a disability activist, um, specifically about you know disability health, chronic illness, and money and all that. And I do think there's probably a lot, and you know she'll tell me, but a lot of the same sort of dynamic with those issues as well. But specifically as it pertains to weight, you know, as you mentioned. The vast majority of diets fail. It is very difficult for people to change their body size um, on a very long-term basis. You know, the vast majority of women who give birth, for example, are going to have a body that is changed for the rest of their lives. Um, and so by every sort of data-driven metric, body types are, they're features that are at least to a very large degree innate to us the way other um, sort of physical or genetic uh, features might be. And yet the way we frame it, even the way I think otherwise pretty with it and woke people will often frame it as, like you said, like get thin or die trying, like perpetually being on the pathway of changing your body despite how unrealistic it is. And I do feel like, you know, we have the data, we have this, you know, body positivity movement, like we should be better about this. Why do you feel that there is still such a persistent myth that this is something that people should always be in the process of changing. Yeah, it's something that I always think about. And I open my book with the sentence that we live our lives aimlessly chasing the concept of self-improvement. It's something that we're taught that we can change. We can't. But the people in charge want us to think otherwise. And the people in charge being the people at the head of these industries, it goes down everything to the media and Hollywood and these images we're seeing. It's people who, you know, lose all this weight, right? People like Rebel Wilson, who can lose all this weight at the age she is and celebrate it and now be this, what she wants to be, this kind of fashion goddess and, and on the red carpets and all these things. It's people who will have, you know, children, like you said, and then be on the red carpet and be like, it was nothing like Christine Quinn and Selling Sunset, who I love, but at the same time, it's like, she painted as if her body was fine and she was perfect and it was great. People look at those and they say, well, why can't I be like that? Like, what's the difference here? It's weird and it's frustrating because you would think people understand the disconnect here. You would think that that is not real or that is rare and that is not going to be the average experience here. But people still feel that way. They want to aspire to something. They want to go on this journey towards being better because they're told a lot from the diet industry from a very young age that they can be. A majority of the people who struggle with this are people who went on diets when they were like three, four, five years old, when parents started restricting what they were eating, uh, sending them different snacks in elementary school. 
that continues to build on itself. It's a mindset thing. And once it's in your minds, I don't think it's possible to take that out. I really have not met anyone who's been able to take that out of their minds. This idea of, well, I can be like this if I try hard enough. If I do the best that I can, I can get there. It's just not true. It's true for other things, which is, I think, why people want to try it. They want to continue to attempt it for as long as they can until they fail. Because it's like, if you work hard enough, you can accomplish anything. They apply that to their bodies then, and they don't take into consideration the fact that bodies are not things that can just be moved and changed and sculpted in whatever way you want. They're living things that will be changed naturally throughout your lifetime. So it's something that we know kind of the disconnect here, we know that this isn't real, the imagery we're seeing on social media, those highlight reels aren't real. But a lot of people still believe that if they try hard enough, they can get close enough to where they can reach that level of confidence, of success, of affluence. But really, it's not going to be possible. And I'm not sure how we get there when body positivity continues to be so commercialized. I think that's the problem here. It's become so far away from where it was that you have people like Kim Kardashian and Skim saying this is for everybody and then they're kind of promoting the exact same body types that we saw in Victoria's Secret for so long how is that for everybody when you're not reflecting everybody and so people are going to think well I should look like that I need to continue to push myself to look like that because body positivity doesn't have the same meaning it did years ago and so it's not helping people in the way it should be. We also I mean we did a video uh recently ish um about how celebrities and influencers gaslight us uh, financially about beauty. Um, And a lot of it is kind of, a lot of it in the video is about, you know, women who, famous women who will have, you know, pretty drastic facial changes, which are supposed to be lighting and makeup and this, that, and the other, but are obviously cosmetic procedures, or they have flawless skin, which is the result of drinking a lot of water, but it's actually you know, frequent laser treatments and having, you know, facialists on staff and all of that, um, or men, you know, who uh, have to go through these radical transformations to play in these superhero movies. And they talk about, you know, eating a lot of chicken breasts and lifting a lot of weights when really they're also on, you know, performance enhancing drugs and they're working, you know, 12 hours a day with a trainer and, you know, have their food micromanaged and all of that. So there is, I think, when it comes to weight loss, you know, you mentioned Selling Sunset, Christine Quinn. So I'm a a long time watcher of The Real Housewives and it's gotten to the point now and you know trigger warning but you know talking about uh, disordered eating but it's gotten to the point now where basically once a season on the franchises there's a woman who her entire storyline for that season is about the fact that she has to that she has a, a very serious eating disorder that she you know is only able to maintain her weight they're almost all incredibly thin many of them seem visibly underweight but they're only able to maintain that weight through you know, whether it's, um, you know, drugs or, you know, uh, super hyper restricting what they eat or compulsively working out or whatever it is. And it does beg the question, you know, of for every one of those women who's being transparent about what it takes to maintain this radical weight loss, how many of them are doing the exact same thing and not saying anything about it? You know, and similarly, when you see these celebrity weight losses, you know, It's very difficult because, you know, for example, when Adele lost a lot of weight, there was this really, I think, very, very tedious discourse about like, oh, people are mad at her for losing weight. I did not see one single person who was like, I'm mad at this woman for losing weight. However, I do think for most celebrities who who lose a very, very substantial amount of weight, we're talking 100 pounds or more and maintain it. There, there is a sort of collective delusion that we have to engage in that this was done by totally above board methods that are accessible to the average person that can be reproduced that are not very expensive that don't involve uh you know surgical interventions that don't involve you know very heavily monitored eating working with a trainer all of these other things that are totally inaccessible and i i do feel like the the really sort of maddening part of it for me is that we're not allowed to be honest about what these things actually take in practice Absolutely. It's like this whole smokescreen of aspiration that you can look to. I think someone like Rebel Wilson, for instance, who lost weight and then kind of went on a whole press tour about it and talked about how great it was and how much better she is. It's doing a harm here. I think, you know, if you want to lose weight and many celebrities do for many different reasons, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. If that's your personal choice, go ahead. How they then market that and speak about it is the harm. And so someone like Adele, I think, handled it 
very well in the way that she spoke about it and really didn't care and didn't want to go out and promote it. She just said, yeah, I did this because I wanted to and that's it. And I think that's the way it should be, right? If you want to lose weight, go ahead and do it. But no one talks about how they do it, right? And if they do, it's like an article in Men's Health or Women's Health about follow this diet on how Rebel Wilson lost 100 pounds in three months. But it's nothing that's tangible. It's something that's real uh, because they, they don't want to show what's real. They know that then that strips away the aspiration aspect there because people will know, well, if you didn't just do it by eating less, then how am I going to do it? I don't have access to personal trainers and I can't go to the gym in the morning and the afternoons. I can't do these things. I have two jobs. I have kids. I have all these responsibilities. Once they pull back that smoke screening, you see how they're actually losing weight, how they're actually having these major Hollywood transformations. You see that it's never going to be attainable. And at that point, even though we know this, but once people see it for themselves, they're going to know, oh, I'm not going to follow this. I'm not going to give into it. And then there's no money to be made ultimately, right? There's no conversation to be had. There's no press headlines to be given to Rebel Wilson anymore. So things like that are going to take away this glamour aspect to losing weight because you'll see it's not oftentimes just eating less, right? These people are, like you said, using drugs and using trainers and having very strict regimens and people prepare, prepare their meals for them. They're having all these things that a normal person has no time, money, or resources for. Once they're told that directly, they're going to stop falling for it. It's, it's frustrating and saddening that people still do fall for it, but it's what they're fed. It's the images that they're t given. It, it's what they're told continuously in the media and through these celebrities and people who they look up to. That's a hard thing. People in these positions of power have these platforms for a reason. People are looking up to them. They're seeing what they want to do. And so when, you know, these people are going to show them the truth, those people are going to walk away. So they're not going to do that. They're going to paint you a version that is aspirational, something that you can look to, something that you can feel inspired by and that you can follow so that you continue to feed into them. So you continue to support them and be a part of their journey and so that they can be a part of yours. None of that is true. None of that is helpful, but it's what we continue to see. Not to bring it back to capitalism, um, my fave, uh, my problematic fave. Um, but how much, I mean, because again, so much of this shit is cognitive dissonance, like, especially when you consider the numbers, especially when you consider how many Americans fall into this very category. Do you feel on some level that it all falls on some, in some way to the fact that it's very lucrative to keep America on this hamster wheel? Um, or do you think it's more than that? I believe that is the issue, 100%. I think capitalism is the issue, will always be. That's why I do not have as much hope as some people that we're gonna see a lot of progress and solve these issues because I think capitalism runs everything. And I think that is what the main issue is here. Everything down to the medical industry, right? Is being run by money. Um, and people are not, that's not gonna change. It's only gonna get worse, right? Maybe it'll get better a little and then it'll get worse. It'll go back and forth. Um, but I think that is the main issue here is capitalism, everything from fashion to the medical industry, to Hollywood, to the media, it's all run by this. That's what's force feeding us these messages of get thin or die trying. And I don't think that's going to change unless capitalism itself changes. When you talk about the medical incentives specifically, um, why is it, do you think that it is so much easier in many cases for to default to treating treating the sort of issue of a larger body of, of defaulting and redounding to losing weight um, than to explore what health really means in all of these different bodies. I think it's easier to look at it from that perspective. I think the medical industry has used the statistics about you know how your weight how your body operates at a certain weight. Um, as kind of the scapegoat for a lot of problems. And so instead of digging deeper, they know kind of cut and dry that if you are of a higher weight, you are more predisposed to these problems. That's probably the problem. Let's try that first. If that doesn't work, maybe we'll see something else. They're kind of going for the easy answer. A lot of that is attached to the stigma that is faced against these larger bodies. And so these doctors look at these patients, they see they're of a larger weight, their instant reaction based on that bias and stigma is to offer weight loss because they think based on everything they know 
that that will be the cure for a majority of the problems that they are predisposed for. So let's try that first and then we'll dig in deeper. It all really goes back to this bias and stigma here that they are first judged with um, and, and aren't taken seriously for. And there are many people who have gone on their social media platforms in the media to talk about how they were just kind of rejected for so long. And by the time that they figured out there was a problem, it was too late. They were just told to lose weight when weight wasn't the problem and the doctor finally looked and saw that it was too late. The problem was there. There had to be a different course of action. Um, and so I think they judge by the weight first because they look at things like the BMI and, and what those kind of studies show them um, that yes, maybe if you are of a higher weight, you are predisposed to X, Y, and Z. You can't have a higher risk of all of this. That is all true. However, that does not mean that it's going to be the problem. There can be another problem there that a thin person is experiencing as well but if you can't look past the weight and not consider the weight there, then you're not gonna see that. But people can't look past the weight. When it comes to someone who is watching this and feels like they're on a hamster wheel of consumerism driven around feeling like they need to change their body to have the career that they want or to um, you know, be perceived a certain way or to shop at certain stores or whatever it might be, um, how do you advise people to, as best they can, unplug themselves from that matrix? My best advice is to surround yourself with people who can help you through that. It is an incredibly difficult journey, an incredibly difficult battle, and it's so complex. I think that's what frustrates me is when people don't talk about the complexity there, that it's so up and down. There's never gonna be this moment of peak body positivity, of peak self-love. It is such a journey because you're force fed these messages for so long. It's so hard to pull away from them. My biggest advice is to really find those communities who accept you, center you, who can give you advice, a listening ear, help you through this, who can relate, who understand that specific struggle. I think the beauty of the plus size community is that there's not one plus size experience as opposed to different identities. Anyone can be plus size, anyone of any background, race, um, you know, any industry. So you can find people who specifically understand your struggle, your battle, your journey, surrounding yourself with them, I think is the key in being able to start to work forward, to take steps forward. I don't think there's a point where someone can say, I'm healed. I don't think that's possible. But I think there's a point where they can say, I'm working on it and I'm getting better. And that's only possible when you have your community around you. Now to throw it in the other direction, and if you can solve this, then I mean, listen, that's world peace level stuff, but like almost every millennial woman I know has like a tenuously body positive outlook and is like, you know, I'm trying to get better about how I look, you know, just like decoupling my idea of health from my idea of weight, like all this good stuff, like focusing on what makes me feel good and gives me energy and strength and whatever. Has a mom, a boomer mom, who's like gonna just be like punishing themselves relentlessly and eating Snackwell's cookies and like you know, berating themselves for not being the size they were before they gave birth a couple times until they die, probably. Like they're just really hooked up to that 24 seven body shame machine that I think, and of course I'm sure it affected men in a lot of ways as well, but I think for women of our mother's generation and beyond was um, I think just like, you know, 10 times, I think what a lot of women our age experience in the media and in their culture around them. You know, and, I, and a lot of us, I think, have that feeling of like, I want to, I want her to feel differently about herself, all these women in their lives. Like when you're speaking to someone else, what do you say? It's hard to like know what to say. <laughs> I, don't, it, I don't think there's one answer. I think first like listening is very important to the certain circumstances. Um, what's hard is how generational it all is. And, and you mentioned this, but you know, all of this is passed down. I think taking the time to understand that first, that how that impacts someone is really important. Um, I think what the problem is nowadays is people want to help others first rather than help themselves. So a lot of women in those situations will say, you know, I support everybody, I have all these things. They'll promote these messages that are really good, but do they feel that themselves? Not really because they're not working on it themselves. 
Um, I think a lot of it is just like being honest and saying, you know, this is what I'm going through. This is what I struggle with. This is my insecurity. Having that conversation, um, at least opening up the door for it and opening it up with other people to find what that common connection is there. But I mean, it's a hard situation. I, I don't think anyone knows the best way to be able to go about that um, because it is such like a personal and individual conversation. But I think the more that we at least offer honesty and transparency um, and kind of go on that self journey and really figure it out internally, like what's the cause of this? Like, why do I hate this about myself? Why does this bother me? Figure that out. I think the closer we'll get to be able to making progress there. One boundary that I've found to be quite effective is no negative food talk at the table. I'm shooting that down relentlessly. Like if a woman is like, oh, I really shouldn't be eating these fries. I'm like, either don't eat them or don't say that. Like we, we, we're eating the fries. The fries are delicious. We're not going to neg the fries and make them taste like ash in our mouths because we shouldn't be having them. Like not allowing the negative talk. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the thing is people it's their like instant reaction to say things like that, right? They're not even really thinking about it. They just say it because that's what they think like they should say in that moment, but it really does have an effect, right? So setting those boundaries is important, which is also why, you know, putting the people around you as people who reflect that message is important as well. So you're in comfortable spaces. Um, but for a lot of people saying this stuff like that, it's just an instant reaction. It's something they've done forever and they really don't even understand the impact it has. But like, don't say it. Be aware of like the impact that your words have. That's the least that we could do is like be aware that our words have impact. Yes, they make food taste worse. So we're almost out of time here, but the time has come. It is our famed, our beloved, our what? Our what's another like good superlative? <laughs> um, infamous. Our infamous. Uh, question that I have to scroll a million miles to go get to. Our rapid fire questions here at TFD. Uh, as a reminder, Gianluca, you are free to take, pass, whatever comes to mind. These are purely financial in nature. So, you know, whatever comes off the top. What is the big financial secret of your industry? And can we say for the fashion industry? For the fashion industry, the big secret that I really hope is not so much of a secret anymore, but it's that the people who are the most successful come from money and have that level of privilege where they can bypass those entry level phases. Um, I don't think I know many people who make it to the top who do not have that esteemed level of privilege. So that is definitely the, the big secret that I don't feel is a secret, but people kind of still act like it's not a known fact. Well, depressing, but validating, I guess, because I always felt that that must be the case. Like, man, like freaking, I was on, I was like taking a doom stroll through, um, I have like a couple heiresses that I do not follow on Instagram because it would be so bad for my mental health, but I occasionally go look at them or whatever, like so, not heiresses, socialites. And one of them was like, I'm sure you know her, she's a huge fashion person, Lauren Santo Domingo. Mm -hmm. She's got like the most aspirational, it's just, like ridiculous. I don't even personally find it that aspirational because it just seems too perfect. But anyway, she's like a fashion maven, like launched this like really famous uh, moda operandi, whatever, like she's whatever. I Googled her husband, a uh, billionaire, and not even a self-made, inherited a billion, like multi-billion dollars. And I'm like, why do I look these things up? Why do I even want to know? Right. That makes you feel bad. I felt that way when I watched My Orthodox Life on Netflix. And it was like of this woman who left her like Orthodox background to move to New York and got remarried and like started this fashion empire. I was like, oh my God, a self-made story. We love this. Um, she literally just married the the husband of the leading modeling agency in the world. And then he gave her a shoe line and that was it. And I was like, wow, not as inspirational as I had hoped. Listen, don't meet your heroes financially, I think is the takeaway. Um, what do you invest in versus what are you cheap about? This is hard. I am, I definitely feel like I invest in clothes I buy a lot of clothes but I'm like smart about it now whereas years ago I was like just buy every fast fashion thing now I buy things that are like of higher quality last longer I invest in a lot of that I feel now as opposed to just spending like $30 on a shirt I definitely put more money towards buying things of a higher quality um, which is not an easy thing but it's something I'm trying to get better at doing as I get older um, what am I cheap about I definitely am cheap about it's the worst, but I'm cheap about like everyday costs. So little things that like really have no impact and I really shouldn't care about. 
But even when I'm in New York, things like I'm not paying an extra two dollars for an Uber that is like surcharged right now, like things like that, that really will have no impact on my weekly budget, but that in the moment look like a lot more money. I'm like, no, I'll pass on that. But then I'll go spend like three hundred dollars on a suit. So the balance there, I haven't figured out yet, but I'm working on that. You know, some would say that opting out of those little day to day costs are some of the most important things to get frugal about. Um, what has been your single best investment and why? My best investment, I would say, is I think my best investment would be going to, and it wasn't a huge investment, but going to community college, I think was my best Ooh. investment in like paying that out. Um, and not having to worry about that and getting my education there. And then even when I went to my four year university, I went like local. So it was super cheap making that investment and doing that. And rather than going to my quote unquote dream schools that I wanted to when I was like young and bright eyed, I think was the best investment I made. My favorite answer of all time as a fellow community college student who doesn't and didn't have student debt. I love to see it. Um, what has been your biggest money mistake and why? My biggest money mistake is the amount of money I spend on food all the time, especially when I'm traveling. Um, that is the thing that I'm like, oh, I'll just write it off like it's for work or whatever. I spend so much money on food anytime I'm traveling for work, which is like fine, I guess, like live it up, enjoy it. But I spend a ton of money on that, which I probably should not do. And even when I'm home now, I like order all the time because it's like, I don't have the time to always go shopping, always spend an hour cooking, even though I love cooking. But I think as I've gotten older and now I enjoy it, I'm like, no, if I'm going to cook a meal, I'm going to do like the full thing, make it Instagrammable, the full moment, which has made it like when I'm not doing that, I'm like, oh, I'll just order something to the house. It's fine. So I definitely spent a lot of money. I'm fueling that Uber Eats every day. So um, I would say that is my first investment there. Wish I could say I can't relate to that, but I can. <laughs> I like, I want to do a challenge where it's like no takeout, no restaurants for a month. You could. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I, I just couldn't do it. Oh, it's hard, especially in New York. When I was in New York, that's like the, I can't imagine doing it in New York. Also in New York, my kitchen was so small. I wasn't cooking there. Like now that I'm in like the desert, I have room to cook. But when I was in New York, I was like, I'm not cooking here every night. Like the amount of dishes I would have to do is just not worth it. Yeah, I, I love my kitchen and I do cook in it a lot, but that takeout, man. It just hits. Okay. Um, what is your biggest current money insecurity? My biggest insecurity right now is that I am like about to be 25, pushing into adulthood off my parents' insurance. And what I worry about the most now is being able to pay like all my bills at once. And I like making that leap from like half adult to full adult. I like stresses me out, especially because I want to like buy a home and in this market and not fun. So things like that, thinking like, can I pay for every single one of these bills? How am I going to manage that? Literally keeps me up at night to think about that. So that is like my biggest thing right now is like, how do I make that jump into adulthood where I'm paying for absolutely everything, including a mortgage and not go bald and pull my hair out? So that's, that's the hard thing on my mind. Listen, you're doing better than I was at 25. And also that's what a budget is for. What has been the financial habit that's helped you the most? Um, I learned this from being a freelancer that my money like directly goes into two accounts to separate that and for paying for taxes and then like what I can use. Separating those and like knowing like, all right, I'm gonna be paying 30 to 50% of this in taxes. Like I need to save that, put it aside. Um, and having those separate accounts has been like the biggest blessing so that at the end of the year when I have to pay taxes, it's not shocking and I already have the money set aside for that. Uh, similarly, when I was a freelancer, every time tax day came around, I was like, oh, what? Um, uh oh. Uh, so last question is, when did you first feel successful and what does that word mean to you? Oh, that's hard. I think I first felt successful the day that I had my first article published in Teen Vogue when I was in college, it was the start of my junior year. And I just remember that moment just being like the craziest moment. Um, I was like in my creative writing class at 7.30 in the morning and like ran out into the hallway crying. And it was just like a moment where I was like, oh, I did this. Like I wanted this so bad. I had like started reading Teen Vogue right before their huge revolution. 
um, ahead of the 2016 election. And I was like, I want to be here. And like in two years later, I was at the magazine and it was the craziest thing. And seeing that first article go up with like my name and like that for me is like the biggest moment of success. And I've had like a lot of exciting things happen then and like done great things. But just that one moment writing that one article, which like literally was about a scholarship I got. It was literally about community college. Um, so it has nothing to do with what I ended up doing and like nothing to do with fashion. But just the fact that I like made it there when I wanted to set that goal and like broke in in a place I never thought I would have access to was like the most defining moment for me. And like great stuff has happened, but nothing like has matched the joy of that moment. I love that. Well, I'm sure uh, when you go visit your baby in a bookstore, it will have a similar level of uh, importance. So your book is The Power of Plus. Please remind people where they can go to pre-order it. Yeah, absolutely. You can pre-order at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, all these other bookstores as well. Um, all of it is online, a bunch of indie bookstores as well, which are really great. And there'll be more leading up to the launch as well where they can pre-order. Awesome. And we will be linking, of course, to all of his socials down below in the show notes and description. Um, Gianluca, thank you so, so much for coming by. And thank all of you guys for tuning in. And I will see you next Monday in an all new episode of The Financial Confessions. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.